Good morning, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to chair this panel today at the virtual UN World Data Forum 2020, which is dedicated to the use of semantics applied to, the, to food and agricultural data innovation systems as a key step to achieving the SDGs. This session, this session aims to bring together innovative scientists, practitioners, agronomists, and existing initiatives of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO, partnerships and programs. The panel will discuss lessons learned on develop initiative solutions and exchange of data to enable research, policies, and innovation to better inform humanitarian decision making and achieving SDGs. The objective of the session is to stop taking the use of semantic vocabularies and technologies innovative practices, knowledge sharing, and management, as well to promote the upscaling of innovations that potentially have large benefits for countries on their agricultural planning, increased food security, rural development, and investments. Today, our panelists will be from FAO, the Land Portal Foundation, KTVL in Germany, Nielsen, the University of Nebraska Lincoln UNL and the University of California. Let me introduce myself before we continue with the session. I'm Inma Subiras. I'm one of the co organizers of this um, panel. I'm a senior information management at FAO. And together with me, I would like to introduce Eche Aksoi, who is also working in FAO. Um, and we are both going to moderate this session today. Um, so let's start. I would like to welcome our first panelist, um, Sarah Cummings from Nielsen. Mrs. Sarah Cummings is um, manager of economic research at Nielsen and manages the project AIDS, a global platform for sustainable development data. Thank you, Sarah, and please over to you. So here I will share my screen so everyone will be able to see the presentation. And today I would like to speak to you about a project that we did to understand how we can predict food insecurity in Nigeria and Yemen using a variety of data sources, as well as Project 8, our global data platform for the Sustainable Development Goals. Firstly, I'd like to thank the UN World Data Forum for allowing us to participate in this virtual forum this year. And thank you to Ima and Eche for moderating, the, moderating this panel. One of the challenges that we face in sustainable development planning is that our growing population requires both public and private organizations to have a deep understanding of future human needs. However, we find that the data for research on sustainable development data and also consumer, the data on consumer behavior is not only highly fragmented, highly variable, but it's also challenging to access and navigate. I will first explain how Project Date is working to fix this. Project Date turns big data into actions. Timed with the new Sustainable Development Goals launched uh, as part of the 2030 Agenda, Project Date not only encourages cross-sector collaboration by connecting users around the world focused on similar Sustainable Development Goal topics, it also enables people from around the world to connect, discuss, and analyze the data on evolving human needs and basic demands such as food and water. It additionally, it provides free access to curated dashboards and story maps around sustainable development goal thematic areas. One example is using Esri story maps to have an understanding of the historical and current food security situations in countries such as Egypt. And then on the right hand, you'll see visualizations we created using World Food Program data uh, to look at the um, reduced sorry, reduced coping index, um, how the most vulnerable population limits their, por uh, their portion side or receives help from family or friends or even restricts consumption of their daily meals. Now we'll go into a case study that we created with the World Food Program. The World Food Program needs information quickly in order to respond to emerging food assistance needs. One of the main metrics they use is a household measure of dietary diversity and nutrient density called the food consumption score. 
this food consumption score is critical for World Food Pro Program to adequately understand where they need to provide essential humanitarian resources. The FCS is based on eight food groups and has a seven day recall and they prioritize households with lower borderline food consumption scores. So that way they'd be able to get the emergency assistance to them. And I should note this indicator is collected by phone on a monthly basis. And so this project conducted in 2017 is, is based on the research then. So even with this monthly food collection data, World Food Program may end up within a data gap uh, because they may not have enough information to understand a deteriorating food security situation weeks after they collected this data. So Nielsen, we decided with our project with World Food Program, we might be able to model the food consumption score on a basis of covariates such as food prices, rainfall, and other information to help WFP minimize that gap and also make sure that there's no one left behind with the essential food humanitarian resources that WFP provides these people. As I mentioned before, Nielsen has collaborated with World Food Program in a variety of different ways dating back to 2012. Our most recent example is improving the mobile data collection in 2015, and then this project in 2017, where we would predict the monthly changes in the FCS. So our goal with this hackathon was to predict the FCS with an 80% accuracy, which would not only allow for more timely food assistance, but it would also help to reduce the data collection burden on WFP country offices. So as I mentioned, our objective was to use the, rain, the rainfall data, food price data, and any other relevant or publicly available data within you know, the, the SDGs um, of zero hunger to help understand if we could predict this FCS in at least one country where WFP worked as a pilot. Looking at Northeast Nigeria and Yemen, the food security situation at the time was we were seeing about almost half a million severely malnourished children and 4.7 million people just in Northeast Nigeria who needed food assistance. In Yemen, we saw similar numbers with the number of food severely malnourished children at 462,000 and over 17 million people needed food assistance. We knew we had to do something and we knew we wanted to make sure that this pilot would work so WFP would be able to roll it out to other countries. So here we are with WFP chief economist Arif Hussein when he visited the Nielsen office in New York City. 46 data scientists across Nielsen participated in more than 10 countries and they used their skills-based volunteering time to dedicate more than 150 hours, 115 hours to this project. So here's a, an overview of the components. So as I mentioned before, we focused on Nigeria and Yemen using food price data from World Food Program rainfall data. And again, the outcome was to predict the model with 80% accuracy. So based on our outcome, we were able to predict this with 80% accuracy for the the following month based on the food, uh, food consumption scores of the previous months. So the predictive model was proven sufficiently accurate so that WFP would be able to test it on more countries, even beyond those who are affected by famine. So that way, again, the goal would be to minimize any information gap or, or resource uh, humanitarian assistance gap to the people who needed the food the most, and also minimize the burden placed on the country uh, offices responsible for the data collection. So looking ahead, and especially at data innovations as part of our projects, we're looking to expand the number of data sets we have on our Project 8 platform, which I mentioned before is a platform open to anyone and to all interested in SDG data. So whether you're focused on SDG 2, Zero Hunger, or you're interested in data relating to agricultural yields, please share your expertise, knowledge, and also help contribute to our global data platform so that way we can work together to leave no one behind. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. We are going to move to our next uh, panelist, um, Daniel Martini from KTVL in Germany. Mr. Daniel Martini is responsible for a team working on knowledge technologies at KTVL, and his team supports the activities of FAO around Agrobog by contributing to maintenance, content creation, and dissemination. Agrobog is one of the knowledge platforms of Agrobog. Um, yes, Daniel, it's uh, over to you. 
Yeah, thanks, Emma. I will also uh, share my screen with you to start the presentation. Okay, uh, I would like to talk to you uh, about uh, the use cases and thoughts on innovation, uh, especially on the use of semantics in agriculture in relation to the SGGs and uh, to our work at ATBL. So let me first give a rough overview of what our organization uh, is doing. We are uh, funded by the German Federal Ministry for Food and Agriculture, uh, roughly 90 employees uh, in the office building that you can see on the right of this slide. We have around 400 association members plus a large uh, network of experts uh, with our main mandate being knowledge transfer. So our tasks are uh, around all issues about uh, collecting, preparing and publishing planning data. We prepare expert statements for politicians and administration, giving policy advice. We try to evaluate new methods coming from uh, research and trying to put them into practical use in agriculture. Uh, we, we try to describe state-of-the-art technologies, uh, develop guidelines, and uh, we also do quite some uh, research projects. And during the last years, uh, especially within these research projects, uh, we had a strong focus uh, on semantics and, uh, yeah, uh, we discussed when we when this session was prepared uh, that uh, we might talk a little bit about the information systems used and how we leverage semantics. And uh, actually, I have chosen one of the more recent examples uh, that we're currently working on. Um, it is a it is a system. Uh, in uh, pesticide applications and uh, pest control in plant production, where we actually, what, what we actually do is we have uh, uh, different data sources, like the uh, database for registered pesticides uh, in Germany, which contains information about pesticides, about the active substances, about the crops and the pests. Then uh, we have uh, the database from the European Commission on the maximum residues level. That's mainly on substances and crops, which is at the moment provided as a large XML file. And then we have uh, one uh, more unstructured information resource, which is uh, agricultural advisory alert alerting newsletters. They describe in text for farmers and for advisors um, for example, if certain uh, pests might be coming along uh, and then what you can do against it and also in what regions uh, it occurred. So this is described in texts and uh, basically it also contains information about crops, about pests, uh, locations, pesticides, but also about non-chemical treatments uh, alike. And what we actually do within this uh, system is uh, we convert all the data sources into semantic resources uh, using, uh, for example, for databases, the uh, DB to triples converter. Uh, XML is converted to RDF by a, by a small tool also. And at the moment, we're working on linking this to the, to the FAO Acrovoc concepts. And the idea is to to, to mesh a large knowledge graph, which then allows uh, these applications on the right side. Uh, within the project, we're looking at three specific advisory applications. Uh, they will use this knowledge graph then uh, to deliver directed information on, on pesticide use. Also, how it can be reduced is an important factor. Uh, we want to enable also semantic search and answering scientific questions based on that. And uh, yeah, 
Let me skip towards the benefits. What are the benefits that we see within the use of, of cement or in the use of semantic technologies? Well, uh, I'm, I'm more on the technical side of things and from the programmer's point of view, I think the benefit is very simple. I have drawn here um, six example screenshots uh, for Sparkle endpoints. These are semantic resources uh, spread over the web and basically they all look the same. It might seem a bit boring, but on the other hand, you can also, you can just issue the same, the same queries to all of them without having any, any prior knowledge about the internal data model. Uh, so I think from the, from the point of view of people who want to retrieve data also in agriculture, but also in other domains, this kind of unified API is really is, is to me one of the largest benefits of semantics, of self-describing semantics, actually. And uh, it's not just these six. I think this picture might be known to some of you. It's the linked open data cloud. So you can rely on, on lots of services delivering a very, a very unified and self-describing API, which is, of course, yeah, from the programmer's point of view, quite nice. Regarding the challenges, uh, well, I would like to focus a bit on the FAIR principles. I think they are also quite, quite known in the semantic web community. And uh, first for the benefits, of course, findability, accessibility, reusability, and interoperability are really, really important benefits. But on the other hand, I think also the challenges are encoded within the FAIR principles, like if you go for assigning persistent identifiers, then you face the challenge in agriculture that objects are changing in space and time, and at what point in time should they get a new identifier? I think these are all yeah, some questions also on the interoperability side, how to use vocabularies. I think there is still some there yeah, is some need for building awareness on what uh, vocabulary use actually encompasses and, and also building awareness on which resources are available to be reused. So these are kind of, yeah, in my opinion, the challenges still around the use of cement. Then, yeah, regarding potential future innovations, uh, I would like to give you a very short overview of the four-color theorem. It was a, it's actually a mathematical theorem posing the question of whether you can, uh, whether you can color a map with only four colors and without having touching regions having the same color. And uh, yeah, why, I'm, why am I explaining this here? I think the interesting part is that this theorem was proved by a computer proof. And uh, I think this is the way that uh, semantics can lead us the way because uh, yeah, semantic data resources, actually these are collections of statements. And from these statements, you can infer new knowledge and uh, similar to if we can manage uh, to have really complicated mathematical proofs from sets of statements in automatic systems, I think this is also yeah, the potential of semantic technology in agriculture that we can really infer new knowledge from all these semantic resources now coming up. In practical terms, there are probably still yeah, uh, challenges and difficulties around it, but I think yeah, this is kind of the way where we will see quite some innovations uh, during the next few years. Then regarding how does this, uh, how does this connect and relate to the sustainable development goals? And uh, to motivate this, I would like to start with this picture, um, which basically shows it's from uh, Finnish colleagues from Finnish Research Institute, and it shows how how all these uh, matter flows and energy flows between agricultural compartments actually uh, actually interact. And um, if you if you think about each of these compartments, like the biogas plant, the dryer, the bakery and mill, each of these compartments is producing data. And uh, 
the thing today is actually there is no interoperability between this data and you cannot really do evaluations of the whole system. And this is, uh, well, the point where I think really semantics can go in and then they enable a unified self-describing APIs. They allow for a tight data integration for knowledge inference. So in principle, you can build interlinked digital twins in agriculture to gain a better understanding of complex effects and interdependencies. And uh, yeah, actually in this case, on the, on the modeling and simulation of matter and energy flows, if you can really get the data sources together and run, get a better understanding of the processes, I think this has quite an effect on direct impact on some of the sustainable development goals, but there might also be indirect impacts like uh, yeah, having better information quality that could lead to better, better education, uh, also transparency, which could, uh, could reduce inequality and things like that. Nevertheless, I want to, yeah, I want to dampen the expectations also a little bit. Uh, we also have to think about that IT infrastructure, of course, it also consumes power. It consumes scarce resources in production. It produces uh, potentially toxic electronic waste. Uh, so in the end, uh, I think we should come uh, yeah, uh, to honest evaluations about the use and in, about the usefulness. And in some areas, I actually think uh, that, the, that the semantic approach has uh, uh, some advantages in uh, providing clear interrelation between objects, between compartments in agriculture. Uh, whereas, uh, yeah, this kind of pure big data number cr crunching approach, yeah, in my opinion, has some drawbacks with regard to sustainability. So I think, yeah, we should really uh, put a little thought into how we build our, our information systems and whether semantics could not uh, uh, drive us a bit more uh, further into a good direction. Yeah, thank you so much. That's it from my side. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, we will move to our uh, third panelist, uh, Laura Mejolaro. Laura uh, is the team leader of, uh, at the Land Portal Foundation. Uh, she's responsible for the overall management, implementation, and expansion of the Land Portal. Over to you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ima. Thank you for inviting us to this um, great panel. Let me first say that um, I will be presenting um, my slides along with my colleague, Carlos Tejo, who is our Open Data Officer and Semantic Experts at the Land Portal Foundation and co-authors of these slides. So let me first introduce the Land Portal. It's a small um, non-profit organization based in the, Nether the Netherlands um, that has been working over the last 10 years to improve data sharing and uh, address the extreme fragmentation of uh, land data to improve uh, decision making and policies on land governance. Land is a, a, a multi um, sector um, theme. So it's, it's, it becomes particularly important to address data from different domains and different sources. Next slide, please. So the land portal works to uh, towards building an information, what we call an information ecosystem. So we borrow this term from, from a, the information ecology for land governance that support better informed decision and policy making at national and international level to help eradicate poverty and eliminate hunger and malnutrition. So we aggregate and synthesize wealth of information and data in the form of text, statistical data, graphs, graphics, or special layers, and more, and make them accessible through to our audience via a web portal uh, that link together different knowledge systems. So our portal offers an entry point to a myriad of 
um, external digital platforms. And our work aims to make more efficient the discoverability of land data and information from these different sources, from different geographies and different languages by enabling the use of semantic technologies and so enriching the native metadata and operating as a kind of a backbone for data repositories and also creating the conditions to harmonize uh, information and data across the sector. Um, by doing that, we, we are also collaborating with the FAO and um, creating new semantic standards. Um, which I will describe later. Let me just ask my colleague now to describe how our system uh, works in practice. Thank you very much, Laura. So in this slide, I would like to show the semantic information systems that we are using in the LAMP portal. LAMPportal.org uh, uses, uh, uses Drupal as a content management system uh, that offers an RDF view per each content of the website. In order to store all the RDF views, a database for, us, uh, for semantic information is used. It is a triple store called Virtuoso. Using Drupal modules, all RDF views of LAMPortal.org uh, are imported into Virtuoso. Using uh, pieces of software called importers, we also uh, import the statistical information from different sources and we store them also in the Virtuoso in RDF. LAMPortal.org retrieves the statistical information from Virtuoso using the standard, the standard query language for the semantic web, that is Sparkle. With that information visualization, uh, with that information, we create visualizations like charts, dashboards, and, map, and maps. On top of that, we are using a control vocabulary called LAMVOC, that is a subset of 300 concepts of Agrobook for cataloging all the content in our portal. So what are the challenges and the benefits uh, of using semantic web technologies and the challenges and benefits of, that we are facing in the LAMP portal? So one of the first challenges that we have is the lack of maintenance of the Drupal semantic uh, related models that are not uh, really well uh, maintained at this point in, for Drupal 7. Another challenge that uh, we are we're facing is uh, trying to find the best property that special relations between, uh, between concepts in our data model. Sometimes it's quite a straightforward, but sometimes you really need to dig and to think and rethink about the best solution. And one, and one of the mm, biggest challenges that we have is the technology gap the, that we have in the land sector, because we are dealing with uh, organizations that sometimes the, they don't publish the information or they publish in a HTML website, and we need to deal with that in order to aggregate all that information. And what are the benefits of using the semantic uh, technologies? So maybe the first one could be the interoperability. Using semantic web technologies, the interoperability is faster, cheaper, and more accurate. Also, uh, in order to uh, reuse the information, you don't need to learn another language or you don't need to learn uh, an ad hoc uh, API. We use, uh, you can use Sparkle plus the data model that we have. And maybe the latest benefits that we, we have in the LAMP portal is we, be, um, we work in an uh, open as default strategy and environment. So this increase a lot the trust between our partners, the LAMP portal and the LAMP portal partners. And what are the innovations that we are uh, having in mind for the future? Well, an innovation and uh, a need that we have is to improve this Drupal and Virtuoso communication. Um, another innovation that we are thinking is about how to improve the visualization of the data uh, in the LAMP portal, the statistical data and also geographical data. Something that we want to spend more, um, more resources is the, the promote of the use of the control vocabulary of LAMPOC. So if more um, organization uh, could use this vocabulary, the interoperability will be better. 
and maybe the last one is the land tagger. Uh, a land tagger could be a service, imagine a website where you can just copy paste some uh, description uh, of a document and uh, the, the system suggests you some concepts from Landvoc or from Agrovoc. So you can tag your content uh, more, uh, bet in a better way. So I would want to give back the floor to my colleague, Laura. So how this um, connect with SDGs? So same question as Daniel. Well, as I, as I said before, land uh, is a, a cross uh, cutting and uh, multidisciplinary kind of issue. And therefore um, it's very important to understand the context, to understand the context of land governance to look at from um, the climate and environmental, uh, environmental uh, point of view or from the gender uh, point of view or from um, the economic point of view. So it's uh, looking, at, creating these um, interdependencies is, 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 is very important and then semantic technologies for sure help that. So the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development contains very important targets and indicators for the land community They're under SDG 1, 2, 5, 11 and 15. So uh, many land organizations and stakeholders are committed to fully monitor and implementing the SDGs um, to promote responsible land governance. And we believe that digital and semantic technologies can support that. They are evolving uh, faster and at a speed that we have never seen before, um, transforming the way people um, and organizations and businesses deal with data and information. So digital technologies are creating new opportunities to enable better planning and monitoring. Uh, last slide, and so this is uh, uh, Landvoc. Um, as Carlos was um, introducing before, is, is our small subset of uh, land related concepts. Uh, it's our contribution to Agrovoc is a, is a sub scheme within Agrovoc. We curate it, we make sure it is used by our uh, sector and we make sure that our um, that land data providers use it um, in their own systems to make content more interoperable. So to continue doing what we do as an intermediary provider of knowledge systems that harmonize land data from a multitude of different sources, synthesize it and make it more discoverable for decision making, the use of common semantic vocabularies operating as a backbone, standardizing metadata values for machines to help us retrieve content becomes very, very important. So we believe that uh, the provision of semantic tools such as these can facilitate interoperability and is just uh, as important as uh, uh, raising awareness to uh, maximize access to data. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we will move to our next panelist. Um, um, Patrizio Grassini. Dr. Patrizio Grassini is an associate professor of agronomy at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. And um, yes, it's the floor is, is yours, Patrizio. Thank you very much, Ima, for the invitation to present at the 2020 UN World Data Forum. Um, I'm Patrizio Grassini, professor of agronomy at the University of Nebraska in the US. And, I will talk today about our efforts in developing the Global Yield Gap Atlas. I would like to start by giving you a helicopter view about where we are heading with agriculture globally. We know that um, there will be a 50% increase in the food demand over the next 30 years, mostly driven by population increase together with change in diets, uh, and especially occurring in developing countries. At the same time, we know that the current crop yields and the rate at which they are increasing annually is not sufficient to meet this extra food demand that we expect to occur over the next 50 years, at least not with existing cropland area. And not surprisingly, we have seen that there has been massive expansion of cropland area during the past two decades at a rate of about 13 million per hectare, in many cases at the expense of forest, wetlands and other fragile ecosystems. So we are clearly not on a sustainable pathway 
when it's about trying to fit the world on existing problem. And that's kind of illustrated in this picture where you can see farmers uh, growing upland rice in a sloppy land after this uh, area was uh, clear. So we argue here that if we are really serious about meeting the future food demand without a massive expansion of cropland area, that would only be achieved through sustainable intensification of the agricultural systems. So that every single of hectare of existing cropland area produces near its potential, while it minimizes the environmental footprint and preserves the resource base. And we understand that increasing yields is just one part of the puzzle. It needs to be complemented by institutions, governance, and access to markets in order to make sure that food security reaches everybody, and at the same time, there is a land that is spared for nature. But again, it's very difficult to imagine how we can feed the world and protect natural resources without increasing the productivity of our current cropping systems. And the challenge is in a way illustrated with this very simple scheme shown here, where you have on the left hand the yield potential, which is represented by that, uh, by, the, by the green bar, which is basically the productivity that is uh, achievable on a piece of land, given the climate of that region and together with the, with the soil properties. So if, if management is optimal and there are no barriers to adopt in, um, improve agronomic practices, then, then you should be able to reach this yield potential that is basically limits by the climate and by the soil type. Now, in most of, in most of the cases, uh, the average farmer yield is below this yield potential. And, and by the way, the, that average yield is illustrated on the right hand with the red um, bar. And that's because um, in, in, in the real world, um, crop productivity is limited by other factors such as nutrients, suboptimal management, and incidence of biotic stresses such as pests, weeds, weeds and diseases. And we, and, we re, and we refer to the difference between the yield potential and the average farm yield as the yield gap. Okay, so our yield gap is a difference between that potential yield as driven by climate and by soil versus what the, what the farmers are attaining now on their farms. Now, our, our proposition is not that farmers should completely eliminate that yield gap. There are many reasons why they should not attempt to, uh, to reach that maximum productivity. But we know from our experience working across many systems around the world that farmers that have a reasonable access to markets, inputs, and, ex and, and extension services should be able to attain 70 to 80 percent of that yield potential. That's a yield level that allows farmers to uh, maximize their profit and at the same time also minimize the environmental footprint. So again, our, our goal is not to encourage farmers to reach the yield potential, but rather to uh, encourage them to reach about 70 to, 70 to 80 percent of that yield potential. But regardless what's the cost explaining that yield gap, it is very important to know what's the size of that yield gap first, because understanding what, what, what the magnitude of the yield gap is, is telling you about how much extra food a region can produce with existing land and water pre -pre resources. So again, if we are really concerned about how much food the world can produce on existing cropland area via sustainable intensification, it's very important to quantify the, ex the existing yield gaps. And along those lines, we have started about eight years ago with this project on developing a global yield gap atlas. It's a um, partnership uh, between University of Nebraska and, and Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And we are following a bottom-up approach to estimate these yield gaps, following a global protocol with local application that is based on a strong agronomic foundation. One of the strengths of the Atlas is that uh, we are following the same methodology across countries, across crops, which allows comparisons among countries and also among different regions within a given country. And this tool is available via a web-based platform at www.yegap.org. So far, we have completed the Atlas for more than 70 countries, including major food crops, and, and as you can see uh, on that slide, we are already reaching a majority of the area uh, planted with the four major um, food crops around the world. I'm not gonna go into all the details behind developing this atlas. That will take me um, a lot of time. 
But at least I, I want to I, I give you a flavor about, about what's behind the development of the atlas. Everything starts by um, an identifying the major agroecologies in a given country where crop production takes place. And within those hotspots for crop production, identify a where stations from which we can retrieve climate data. Finding this where data is very important because if you remember my previous slide, the yield potential depends on the climate. And therefore, if we want to estimate that, that potential yield and the associated yield gap, we need to know uh, something about the weather of that region. And not only in one year, but many years in order to have a measure of the average potential and its variability over time, which gives a measure of the climatic risk. But bottom line is that once we have identified the uh, most important regions within a country where a crop is produced and we have weather data available to estimate the yield potential, we also look at the cropping system context and the major soil types where crops are grown. And we embed all this information into crop simulation models that allow us to estimate the yield potential for a given region, for a given country, for a given crop. And by comparing the model simulations against the average productivity attained nowadays by producers, we can estimate the yield gap. And this yield gap is estimated at different um, levels of, of spatial ag aggregation, all the way from local level up to country level. This is a, a snapshot from uh, our Atlas website. In this case, uh, I took a screenshot that shows the uh, yield gaps for rainfall maize around the world. Uh, red and green uh, colors uh, highlight countries with largest and smallest gaps for, for maize. And, um, and as you can see here, the, the, there is a quite wide range of e gaps around the world. If you look at um, countries in Europe, in Western Europe or in the US, you can see that the yield gap um, represents about 10 to 30% of the yield potential. In other words, farmers are attaining 70 to 90% of the yield potential, which virtually means that they have already reached that attainable yield level that I was uh, talking about before. If you look at uh, countries in South America, for example, in Brazil, in Argentina, maize growers in these regions are reaching about 40 to 50% of the yield potential. So they have an intermediate magnitude of the gap. And if you look now on um, in places in Af in Sub-Saharan Africa and South India, the yield gap is much larger and farmers are uh, only attaining about 10 to 30 percent of what they can potentially obtain there with good agronomic management. Um, I have to make the warning here that this uh, screenshot is from our new map viewer, which is not currently available in our website, but it's going to be fully functioning starting on October 10th uh, onwards. All right, so what can we use this Atlas for? First of all, it provides a robust estimates on crop yield gaps at local to national special scales, which in turn provides estimate of the untapped crop production potential on existing farmland. And this, and this information is essential, for example, for countries that have a goals in reaching cell sufficiency for a specific crops. At the same time, this provides essential support on uh, how and where to prioritize investments in research and development to achieve food security and how to monitor impact over time. And along those lines, uh, our GIGAPA Atlas has been selected as one of the non-official indicators for the SDG2 on uh, zero hunger. And finally, um, the Atlas provides a very solid foundation for explaining and closing the yield gap for studying uh, food security, climate change, land use, as well as to uh, tackling issues related with the environmental footprint of agriculture. So if you work on any of these issues, I will invite you to, to visit our Atlas website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrizio. And now we, we should be moving to our last presentation today. And this is uh, Julia Bailey Serres from University of California. Dr. Bailey Serres is a distinguished professor of genetics at the University of California Riverside. And she is known for her research on mechanisms of plant adaptive responses to environmental stress and development. Welcome to this panel, Julie. Thank you. 
So I'd like to start by, by thanking um, Emma and Nietzsche for this opportunity to speak to you about the challenges that a genomicist faces in terms of semantics um, when, when the goal is to improve yields and to, as Patricio just mentioned, reduce the, the yield gap to crop production and at the same time have a smaller environmental footprint um, for agriculture. So the goal to reduce the yield gap is challenged by the fact that there is climate variability um, as well as soil degradation that reduces the production of, of, of crops. There's also a very rapid evolution of pests and pathogens. And of course, there's the, the shift in human diets that, that necessitate greater yields in addition to the increases in population. And what I'd like to talk to you about is these challenges from the perspective of a molecular geneticist who's working to identify traits that um, aid the various crop plants that are essential for human diets in terms of um, better productivity under drought, flooding, temperature extremes, and nutrient limitations. So we know from climate models as well as from biogeographic data that climate is um, limiting yields because of its increasing um, unpredictable nature. And this is not something very new. It's been happening for quite a long time right now as shown by this graph with data that's from 1950 to 2000 in terms of uh, regions where crop yields were limited by, by drought. But we also know the projection for the future is, is quite bleak. From the perspective of a, of a crop geneticist, we can take advantage of the genetic variation that exists in nature. So I work on rice. Rice was domesticated 10,000 years ago in, in China um, from two wild relatives. It was domesticated by, by mankind 3,000 years ago um, as a slightly different rice species, taking advantage of wild relatives in, um, in Africa. And if you just look at this, this um, map, you can see that, that eight others or eight species in total are represented. And these are, these are eight of um, over 20 rice um, wild species that exist. These provide genetic solutions to climate change problems because in many instances, um, rice wild relatives grows in, in environments that include droughts, floods, and temperature extremes, for example. And so in order to improve rice, as well, and the same strategy applies in general to, to crops, um, in order to do so, we in many instances can harm, harness genetic diversity. This requires that we have seed repositories or, or seed banks, that we evaluate traits, we integrate this with genomic data that that um, more or less empowers these technologies and we apply breeding. So this image on the left shows a field of rice grown at the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines where a number of different varieties have been surveyed for their ability to be productive um, in, under low water input. And so here's a genotype that's doing well despite the fact that there was a drought and others that are doing poorly. In terms of uh, semantics and communication and the effectiveness of this strategy, the FAIR principles that were already mentioned in this panel are important. So in, for seed banks, collection data is essential, whether or not it's a wild species and more particularly the location um, and qualities of the soil and other aspects of that location are very important as we go forward with the strategy. In terms of trade evaluation, this has become a high throughput endeavor. Um, phenotyping platforms are very quantitative, involve imaging, and the practicality of collecting this data and making it useful for many is, is challenging. There need to be standardizations in repositories and access to this information. Genomic data is something that has become extremely important in breeding by having genome sequence information 
It um, accelerates the ability to identify the genetic variables and to map them to the regions of chromosomes that carry the genes that are important for these traits. And so I mentioned, I mentioned that wild species of rice exist. These have been sequenced in many instances. And in terms of, of rice, over 3,000 um, different varieties have been sequenced. This information accelerates breeding. And during this process, it's not just the breeding that's happening um, at research institutes, but it's the interaction between the breeders and the farmer participation in cultivar selection that's important where communication and principles of semantics are important. There's been many success stories in terms of improving crop um, environmental stress resilience. And rice is really quite spectacular where there are examples of flooding survival. This is the area that I work on. Um, drought and water capture, and the other things that are listed here in this table where there are some success stories. In terms of other crops, major crops, particularly wheat and corn, the success stories through breeding genes that exist in nature is not as, as significant. And this is often because the genetic diversity is less, particularly as we move to corn which was um, domesticated from species in Central America and doesn't have the broad geographic distribution of rice, for example. So in cases of, of corn, where it's been difficult to, to um, tackle questions such as um, both drought and also flooding, researchers have turned to using genetic modification technologies or GM technologies, and this is where Instead of using breeding, the gene that ultimately confers the trait has at some point in its career gone through a test tube, and one or two methods have been used to reinsert that gene into the plant species. And I just want to make um, a point that these strategies are important, and in terms of communication um, and, and acceptance, we need to really consider that um, education and also standards and safety and, um, and testing are critical, whether it's uh, non-GM success or GM success. And so one of the major things where we have made some progress in breeding is in pathogen protection. There's also been success stories along these lines using GM plants, but pathogens are rapidly evolving and as shown here in this image, you can see a cultivar that's resistant to bacterial leaf blight, so these are rice, and a cultivar that's susceptible to bacterial leaf blight. This cultivar is resistant because of a gene that was bred into rice from a wild relative. But resistance is not durable because of the, the evolution of pathogens. And researchers have come to understand the mechanisms by which plants are attacked by, for example, bacterial leaf bite um, pathogen. And they know that the pathogen injects a protein that goes into the plant cell where it activates a gene that allows the plant to provide the sugars made through photosynthesis to feed the pathogen. Researchers have figured out a way to outsmart the pathogen by specifically using genome editing a new technology often referred to as CRISPR-Cas9 editing um, to modify the very few letters in the genetic code at a specific site in the rice genome so that the bacterium does not have this ability to activate this gene. In order for a technology such as this to become effective, um, it there requires a lot of acceptance as well as um, very fine regulatory control. But the important point is this is a strategy whereby farmers can alert their, um, ultimately the researchers of a new um, susceptibility and there can be a really proactive response. And so finally, in terms of improving crops using both old and new technologies, there's a lot of opportunities and semantics are important here because they are oftentimes highly interdisciplinary. So this um, image shows you a root system and farming has affected 
the environment and soils and soil health. There is a relationship between the plant and the microbiome or the microbes of the soil that is really critical for the plant's nutrition and also for water uptake in dry soils. And so researchers are working on the genes, understanding the plant microbial interactions and moving forward so that soil health improves and also crop species are better able to leverage microbes of the soil for nutrient uptake. Another thing that is being done is, um, and this is, really, this is really synthetic biology, but photosynthesis has been engineered so that the plant is not um, um, really as, I should say that, so that photosynthesis has been improved so that plant biomass increases and overall production increases. And a key point here is that that plants have not managed to evolve as quickly as our climate has evolved. And really this is adjusting the system so that we can catch up. And then finally, a number of different um, approaches have been developed where there are application to the plants. So we understand how plants respond to drought. They produce a hormone and that hormone is a small molecule. It's now possible to take small molecules and spray them on plants. And these molecules act as antitranspirants so that the farmer can apply them in a timely manner when there's going to be um, a sudden um, hot, dry um, temperature event and so their plants are protected. And then finally, really looking towards the future, there will be increasing use of sensor technology so that farming management is improved and these sensors will, will include nanosensors, something that's at really the fine um, cellular level of the plant in order for there to be protection. For all of these opportunities, communication and understanding that involves, that involves uh, consistent semantics is important. So thank you for letting me give you my perspective on this, on this topic as well. Thank you so much, uh, Julia. So I would like to thank uh, to all the panelists for this uh, very interesting set of presentations. We have uh, still a little bit of time and uh, we would like to uh, suggest to, to go for some questions that we think that could be of interest also for the audience that are listening this video during the UN uh, World Data Forum. I will bring the flow to my colleague Eche, who is uh, already uh, preparing some questions for some of the panelists. Eche, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ima. Thanks a lot, uh, all the presenters. I really enjoy uh, listening all. I have a question to Patricio, first of all. Um, Patricio, what do you think about, what are the main reasons um, of the yield gaps uh, for the major cropping systems and what would be your uh, suggestions to the governments, international institutions, scientists, farmers on achieving the uh, food security. If you could please um, tell us shortly, it would be great. Thanks. All right. I will try to give a short answer to a quite a very important question, uh, if I can. Um, so, um, we know that there is a gap in pretty much every single cropping system around the world, but um, the fact is that the cause behind that yield gap is very different uh, across different regions, different crops. And therefore, what one cannot really, you know, give one or two reasons that would explain the gap uh, across all places. So we know that the the, the gap is widespread, but but the cause is is local and crop specific. And along those lines, we are making some efforts also through the Global Yegap Atlas to provide some indication about what can be behind those gaps. And we're working, for example, on, on estimating nutrient gaps uh, for, some, uh, for some regions. But again, um, one cannot really tell, you know, one, two things that will explain the gap uh, uh, across the board. The cost is really local and, and needs to be identified um, 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 by by uh, by looking at what farmers are doing now, uh, how are they how they how they're doing the resources, and also keep in mind that even if we identify the cause, uh, there may be good reasons for for that gap to exist. For example, 
access to markets, access, access to technology, access to knowledge. So it's just it's just way more than 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 measuring the size of the gap and identifying the cost. Um, it's also challenging to find what's the precise agronomic uh, practice to overcome that gap and. And putting all that together requires a close co close collaboration between agronomists, data scientists, governments, and farmers. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, you're right. Uh, it's very limited time and lots of diversity. Uh, Julio, please could you uh, answer some kind of same similar question about um, providing your suggestions and critical strategies um, to the governments again or to the farmers um, scientists on achieving uh, food security um, especially in drought prone or flooded regions please thank you so much thank you for this question i have two points that that i'm i would like to make in terms of this the first one is it is that it, would, it empowers researchers to have the germplasm that's um, collected in areas where there are droughts or floods. And so um, it's not always the case, but, but to provide access to, to seeds from the collection of, of the crop of interest that um, is, is from land races where, where there is this survival. Those plants may have the genes that will unlock um, the possibilities to improve the modern varieties. And the second thing I think is very critically important is for governments and, and people in general to keep an open mind about the use of technology that will enable us to increase um, the amount of crops produced and to close the yield gap. In terms of, of human health, we don't really restrict ourselves with methodologies. And it's very important that we consider what is safe, whether or not it's produced through breeding, or if it's produced through uh, um, what we call GM technology, or one of the newer technologies. It's not the method, it's the outcome. And in order for us to feed people, we really have to be blind to how we get there. It's what we do. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Ima, over to you. Right. Um, yeah. I have a question for um, Laura, Daniel, and if Sarah also wants to join. It's more about, I mean, we have people in the audience that have been now listening for one hour about semantics and what you have been implementing in your information systems. And I was just wondering whether, um, what recommendations you could give in case that um, these, uh, these people decide to uh, start using these semantics and um, they need to, to, to look for a provision of tools and standards. What kind of recommendations you would say? What is the first step that people would need to take in order to say, yes, I want to start using uh, vocabulary semantics that are meaningful for my information systems? Okay, maybe I can start. Um, I think uh, the land portal works with always one goal in mind, which is creating this enabling environment for data sharing. So it, 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 it involves different aspects. It involves um, building uh, or enforcing the existing data infrastructure. So uh, looking for existing standards, vocabularies, trying to not reinvent the wheel, trying to use what exists, build collaborations with organizations that are already developing um, uh, vocabularies, other standards. And, and then the second important point is building the capacity of individuals, organizations um, to uh, share information more efficiently. And this has to do with capacity building. And again, uh, it's not something organizations can do alone. There is a need for uh, know-how guides. There is a need for courses. And, and again, the collaboration. Uh, is is very important. So uh, sharing data is is a matter of um, a, a, a sh adopting a sharing attitude. So it's a change, behavioral change, a cultural change, and um, and that's why uh, at the same time 
is a matter of uh, reinforcing the data uh, infrastructure. So um, the key in, 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 in my opinion is establishing strong data partnerships and collaborations with like-minded uh, organizations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. I don't know. Yeah, Daniel, your turn. Yeah, maybe maybe I can add to that. Uh, Laura has already mentioned, I think, two important aspects that I that I can only stress. Uh, one is the aspect of reuse. If you jump into this area of semantics, really first make sure that you do do a little bit of research, looking out who is doing what and what could be reused because uh, basically all the interoperability in the semantic web relies on reusing vocabularies and things like that that are already existing. And the second point is, um, um, and that's more, let's say, a self-critical remark for the organizations that are already doing this, uh, we should really go out and raise a bit, yeah, raise the awareness about the semantic resources that are already existing and also give guidance on how to use it, provide documentations and things like that. So these are, I think, really, really two sides of the same coin, uh, only, yeah, it, it's important for different people, so to say, yeah. Uh, there is any other person that would like to contribute, Snow Yanada, or there is any other question that the the audience would like to to make to any panelists? Otherwise, I think that is is uh, time to close the session, Eche. I think it was a pleasure to have you all here. Um, there was a very diverse, as I said. Um, set of presentations. We had uh, predictive analytics. We also had soil, agronomy, land data, and crop data from different angles. I think that was very, I mean, for me, it was very interesting. Where um, I really learned a lot from all of you today as well. Eche, do you would like to add something? Yeah, um, same for me. I also learned a lot. And thank you so much uh, for, for this opportunity. Um, I don't have anything to add. Thank you. So for the audience, uh, we will see um, all your questions in the chat. Um, probably you have already put some of these questions uh, since this, we started the session. So we'll try to answer as soon as we can. And we appreciate very much that you watch this video and that you attended the UN World Data Forum 2020, the virtual one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.